Hi guys, today I'm going to be reading pages 1 through 45 of Coraline by Neil Gaiman with illustrations by Dave McKean. Chapter 1. Coraline discovered the door a little while after they moved into the house. It was a very old house. It had an attic under the roof and a cellar under the ground and an overgrown garden with huge old trees in it. Coraline's family didn't own all of the house. It was too big for that. Instead, they just owned part of it. There were other people who lived in the old house. Miss Fink and Miss Forcible lived in the flat below Coraline's on the ground floor. They were both old and round, and they lived in their flat with a number of aging Highland Terriers who had names like Hamish and Andrew and Jock. Once upon a time, Miss Spink and Miss Forcible had been actresses, as Miss Spink told Coraline the first time she met her. You see, Caroline, Miss Spink said, getting Coraline's name wrong. Both myself and Miss Forcible were famous actresses in our time. Don't let Hamish eat the fruitcake. He'll be up all night with his tummy. It's Coraline, not Caroline. Coraline, she said. In the flat above Coraline's, under the roof, was a crazy old man with a big mustache. He told Coraline that he was training a mouse circus, but he wouldn't let anyone see it. One day, little Caroline, when they are all ready, everyone in the whole world will see the wonders of my mouse circus. You ask me why you cannot see it now. Is that what you ask me? No, said Coraline quietly. I ask you not to call me Caroline. It's Coraline. The reason you cannot see the mouse circus, said the man upstairs, is that the mice are not yet ready and rehearsed. Also, they refuse to play the songs I have written for them. All the songs I have written for the mice to play go oompa oompa, but the white mice will only play toodle oodle, like that. I am thinking of trying them on different types of cheese. Coraline didn't think they, there really was a mouse circus. She thought the old man was probably making it up. The day after they moved in, Coraline went exploring. She explored the garden. It was a big garden. At the very back was an old tennis court. But no one in the house played tennis, and the fence around the court had holes in it, and the net had mostly rotted away. There was an old rose garden filled with stunted, fly-blown rose bushes. There was a rockery that was all rocks. There was a fairy ring made of squidgy brown toadstools, which smelled dreadful if you accidentally stepped on them. There was also a well. On the first day, Coraline's family moved in. Miss Spink and Miss Forcible made a point of telling Coraline how dangerous the well was, and they warned her to be sure she kept away from it. So Coraline set off to explore it so that she knew where it was, to keep away from it properly. She found it on the third day in an overgrown meadow beside the tennis court, behind a clump of trees, a low brick circle almost hidden in the high grass. The well had been covered up by wooden boards to stop anyone falling in. There was a small knot hole in one of the boards, and Coraline spent an afternoon dropping pebbles and acorns through the hole and waiting and counting until she heard the plop as they hit the water far below. Coraline also explored for animals. She found a hedgehog and a snake skin, but no snake, and a rock that looked like just like a frog and a toad that looked just like a rock. There was also a haughty black cat who sat on walls and tree stumps and watched her, but slipped away if she ever went to play with it. That was how she spent her first two weeks in the new house, exploring the garden and the grounds. Her mother made her come back inside for dinner and for lunch, and Coraline had to make sure she dressed up warm before she went out, for it was a very cold summer that year. But go out she did, exploring every day until the day it rained, when Coraline had to stay inside. What should I do? asked Coraline. Read a book, said her mother. Watch a video. Play with your toys. Or go and pester Miss Spank and Miss Forcible, or the crazy old man upstairs. No, said Coraline. I don't want to do those things. I want to explore. I don't really mind what you do, said Coraline's mother, as long as you don't make a mess. Coraline went over to the window and watched the rain come down. It wasn't the kind of rain you could go out in. It was the other kind, the kind that threw itself down from the sky and splashed where it landed. It was rain that meant business, and currently, its business was turning the garden into a muddy, wet soup. Coraline had watched all the videos, she was bored with her toys, and she'd read all her books. She turned on the television and went from channel to channel to channel. But there was nothing on but men in suits talking about the stock market and talk shows. Eventually, she found something to watch. It was the last half of a natural history program about something called protective coloration. She watched animals, birds, and insects, which disguised themselves as leaves or twigs or other animals, to escape from things that could hurt them. She enjoyed it, but it ended too soon and was followed by a program about a cake factory. It was time to talk to her father. Coraline's father was home. Both of her parents worked, doing things on computers, which meant that they were home a lot of the time. Each of them had their own study. Hello, Coraline, he said when she came in, without turning around. Hmm, said Coraline, it's raining. Yeah, said her father, it's bucketing down. No, said Coraline, it's just raining. Can I go outside? What does your mother say? She says you're not going out in weather like that, Coraline Jones. Then no. But I want to carry on exploring. 
Then explore the flat, suggested her father. Look, here's a piece of paper and a pen. Count all the doors and windows, list everything blue, mount an expedition to discover the hot water tank, and leave me alone to work. Can I go into the drawing room? The drawing room was where the Joneses kept the expensive and uncomfortable furniture Coraline's mother had left them when she died. Coraline wasn't allowed in there. Nobody went in there. It was only for the best. If you don't make a mess, then you don't touch anything. Coraline considered carefully, then she took the paper and pen and went off to explore the inside of the flat. She discovered the hot water tank. It was in a cupboard in the kitchen. She counted everything blue, 153. She counted the windows, 21. And she counted the doors, 14. Of the doors that she found, 13 opened and closed. The other, the big carved brown wooden door at the far corner of the drawing room, was locked. She said to her mother, where does that door go? Nowhere, dear. It has to go somewhere. Her mother shook her head. Look, she told Coraline. She reached up and took a string of keys from the top of the kitchen door frame. She sorted through them carefully and selected the oldest, biggest, blackest, rustiest key. They went into the drawing room. She unlocked the door with the key, and the door swung open. Her mother was right. The door didn't go anywhere. It opened onto a brick wall. When this place was just one house, said Coraline's mother, that door went somewhere. When they turned the house into flats, they simply bricked it up. The other side is an empty flat on the other side of the house, the one that's still for sale. She shut the door and put the string of keys back on top of the kitchen door frame. You didn't lock it, said Coraline. Her mother shrugged. Why should I lock it? She asked. It doesn't go anywhere. Coraline didn't say anything. It was nearly dark outside now, and the rain was still coming down, pattering against the windows and blurring the lights of the cars in the street outside. Coraline's father stopped working and made them all dinner. Coraline was disgusted. She said, you've made a recipe again? It's leek and potato stew with a tarragon garnish and melted gray cheese. Coraline sighed. Then she went to the freezer and got out some microwave chips and a microwave mini pizza. You know I don't like recipes, she told her father, while her dinner went around and around and the little red numbers on the microwave counted down to zero. If you tried it, maybe you'd like it, said Coraline's father, but she shook her head. That night, Coraline lay awake in her bed. The rain had stopped and she was almost asleep when something went t t t She sat up in bed. Something went creak. Coraline got out of bed and looked down the hall but saw nothing strange. She walked down the hall. From her parents' bedroom came a low snoring. That was her father. And an occasional sleeping mutter, which was her mother. Coraline wondered if she dreamed it, whatever it was. Something moved. It was a little more than a shadow, and it scuttled down a darkened hall fast, like a patch of night. She hoped it wasn't a spider. Spiders made Coraline intensely uncomfortable. The black sheep went into the drawing room, and Coraline followed it a little nervously. The room was dark. The only light came from the hall, and Coraline, who was standing in the doorway, cast a huge and distorted shadow onto the drawing room carpet. She looked like a thin, giant woman. She was just wondering whether or not she ought to turn on the lights when she saw the black shape edge slowly out from beneath the sofa. It paused and then dashed silently across the carpet toward the farthest corner of the room. There was no furniture in that corner of the room. Coraline turned on the light. There was nothing in the corner, nothing but the old door that opened onto the brick wall. She was sure that her mother had shut the door, but now it was open ever so slightly. Just a crack. Coraline went over to it and looked in. There was nothing there, just a wall built of red bricks. Coraline closed the old wooden door, turned out the light, and went to bed. She dreamed of black shapes that slid from place to place, avoiding the light until they were all gathered together under the moon. Little black shapes with little red eyes and sharp yellow teeth. They started to sing. We are small, but we are many. We are many, we are small. We were here before you rose. We will be here when you fall. Their voices were high and whispering and slightly whiny. They made Coraline feel uncomfortable. Then Coraline dreamed a few commercials, and after that, she dreamed of nothing at all. Chapter 2. The next day, it had stopped raining, but a thick white fog had lowered over the house. I'm going for a walk, said Coraline. Don't go too far, said her mother, and dress up warmly. Coraline put on her blue coat with the hood, her red scarf, and her yellow Wellington boots. She went out. Miss Spink was walking her dogs. Hello, Caroline, said Miss Spink. Rotten weather. Yes, said Coraline. I played Portia once, said Miss Spink. Miss Forcible talks about her Ophelia, but it was my Portia they came to see when we trod the boards. Miss Spink was bundled up in pullovers and cardigans, so she seemed more small and circular than ever. She looked like a large, fluffy egg. She wore thick glasses that made her eyes seem huge. They used to send flowers to my dressing room. They did, she said. Who did? asked Coraline. Miss Spink looked around cautiously, looking first over her shoulder and then over the other. P. 
peering into the mists as though someone might be listening. Men, she whispered. Then she tugged the dogs to heel and waddled off back toward the house. Coraline continued her walk. She was three quarters of the way around the house when she saw Miss Forcible standing at the door to the flat she shared with Miss Spink. Have you seen Miss Spink, Caroline? Coraline told her that she had and that Miss Spink was out walking the dogs. I do hope she doesn't get lost. They'll bring on her shingles if she does. You'll see, said Miss Forcible. You'd have to be an explorer to find your way around in this fog. I'm an explorer, said Coraline. Of course you are, said Miss Forcible. Don't get lost now. Coraline continued walking through the gardens in the gray mist. She always kept in sight of the house. After about ten minutes of walking, she found herself back where she had started. The hair over her eyes was limp and wet, and her face felt damp. Ahoy, Caroline, called the crazy old man upstairs. Oh, hello, said Coraline. She could hardly see the old man through the mist. He walked down the steps on the outside of the house that led up past Car- Coraline's front door to the door of his flat. He walked down very slowly. Coraline waited at the bottom of the stairs. The mice do not like the mist, he told her. It makes their whiskers droop. I don't like the mist much either, admitted Coraline. The old man leaned down, so close that the bottoms of his mustache tickled Coraline's ear. The mice have a message for you, he whispered. Coraline didn't know what to say. The message is this. Don't go through the door. He paused. Does that mean anything to you? No, said Coraline. The old man shrugged. They are funny, the mice. They get things wrong. They got your name wrong, you know. They kept saying Coraline, not Caroline, not Caroline at all. He picked up, picked up a milk bottle from the bottom of the stairs and started back up to his attic flat. Coraline went indoors. Her mother was working in her study, and it smelled of flowers. What shall I do? asked Coraline. When do you go back to school? asked her mother. Next week, said Coraline. Hmm, said her mother. I suppose I shall have to get you new school clothes. Remind me, dear, or else I'll forget. And she went back to typing things on the computer screen. What shall I do? repeated Coraline. Draw something. Her mother passed her a sheet of paper and a ballpoint pen. Coraline tried drawing the mist. After ten minutes of drawing, she still had a white sheet of paper with mist written on it in one corner and slightly wiggly letters. She grunted and passed it to her mother. Hmm, very modern, dear, said Coraline's mother. Coraline crept into the drawing room and tried to open the old door in the corner. It was locked once more. She supposed her mother must have locked it again, so she shrugged. Coraline went to see her father. He had his back to the door as he typed. Go away, he said cheerfully as she walked in. I'm bored, she said. Learn how to tap dance, he suggested without turning around. Coraline shook her head. Why don't you play with me, she asked. Busy, he said, working. He still hadn't turned around to look at her. Why don't you go and bother Miss Spink and Miss Forcible? Coraline put on her coat and pulled up her hood and went out of the house. She went downstairs and rang the door of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's flat. Coraline could hear a frenzied woofing as the Scotty dogs ran out into the hall. After a while, Miss Spink opened the door. Oh, it's you, Caroline, she said. Angus, Hamish, Bruce, down now. It's only Caroline. Come in, dear. Would you like a cup of tea? The flat smelled of furniture polish and dogs. Yes, please, said Coraline. Miss Spink led her into a dusty little room, which she called the parlor. On the walls were black and white photographs of pretty women and theater programs in frames. Miss Forcible was sitting in one of the armchairs, knitting hard. They poured Coraline a cup of tea in a little pink bone china cup with a saucer. They gave her a dry garbali biscuit to go with it. Miss Forcible looked at Miss Spink, picked up her knitting, and took a deep breath. Anyway, April, as I was saying, you still have to admit, there's life in the old dog yet. Miriam, dear, neither of us is as young as we were. Madame Arcadi, replied Miss Forcible, the nurse in Romeo, Lady Bracknell, character parts. They can't retire you from the stage. Now, Miriam, we agreed, said Miss Spink. Coraline wondered if they'd forgotten she was there. They weren't making much sense. She decided they were having an argument as old and comfortable as an armchair, the kind of argument that no one ever really wins or loses, but which can go on forever, if both parties are willing. She sipped her tea. I'll read the leaves if you want, said Miss Spink to Coraline. Sorry, said Coraline. The tea leaves, dear. I'll read your future. Coraline passed Miss Spink her cup. Miss Spink peered short-sightedly at the black tea leaves in the bottom. She pursed her lips. You know, Caroline, she said after a while, you are in terrible danger. Miss Forcible snorted and put down her knitting. Don't be silly, April. Stop scaring the girl. Your eyes are going. Pass me that cup, child. Coraline carried the cup over to Miss Forcible. 
Miss Forcible looked into it carefully, shook her head, and looked into it again. Oh dear, she said. You are right, April. She is in danger. See, Miriam, said Miss Spink triumphantly. My eyes are as good as they ever were. What am I in danger from? asked Coraline. Mrs. Spink and Forcible stared at her blankly. It didn't say, said Miss Spink. Tea leaves aren't reliable for that kind of thing. Not really. They're good for general, but not for specifics. What should I do then? asked Coraline, who was slightly alarmed by this. Don't wear green in your dressing room, suggested Miss Spink. Or mention the Scottish play, added Miss Forcible. Coraline wondered why so few of the adults she had met made any sense. She sometimes wondered who they thought they were talking to. And be very, very careful, said Miss Spink. She got up from the armchair and went over to the fireplace. On the mantelpiece was a small jar, and Miss Spink took off the top of the jar and began to pull things out of it. There was a tiny china duck, a thimble, a strange little brass coin, two paper clips, and a stone with a hole in it. She passed Coraline the stone with the hole in it. What's it for? asked Coraline. The hole went all the way through the middle of the stone. She held it up to the window and looked through it. It might help, said Miss Spink. They're good for bad things, sometimes. Coraline put on her coat, said goodbye to Mrs. Spink and Forcible and to the dogs, and went outside. The mist hung like blindness around the house. She walked slowly to the stairs, up to her family's flat, and then stopped and looked around. In the mist, it was a ghost world. In danger, thought Coraline to herself. It sounded exciting. It didn't sound like a bad thing. Not really. Coraline went back upstairs, her fists closed tightly around her new stone. Chapter 3 the next day, the sun shone, and Coraline's mother took her into the nearest large town to buy clothes for school. They dropped her father off at the railway station. He was going to London for the day to see some people. Coraline waved him goodbye. They went to the department store to buy the school clothes. Coraline saw some day-glow green gloves that she liked a lot. Her mother refused to buy them for her, preferring instead to buy white socks, navy blue school underpants, four gray blouses, and a dark gray skirt. But mom, Everybody at school's got gray blouses and everything. Nobody's got green gloves. I could be the only one. Her mother ignored her. She was talking to the shop assistant. They were talking about which kind of sweater to get for Coraline and were agreeing that the best thing to do would be to get the one with the embarrassingly large and baggy in the hopes that one day she might grow into it. Coraline wandered off and looked at a display of Wellington boots shaped like frogs and ducks and rabbits. Then she wandered back. Coraline? Oh, there you are. Where on earth were you? I was kidnapped by aliens, said Coraline. They came down from outer space with ray guns, but I fooled them by wearing a wig and laughing in a foreign accent, so I escaped. Yes, dear. Now, I think you could do with some more hair clips, don't you? No. Well, let's say half a dozen, to be on the safe side, said her mother. Coraline didn't say anything. In the car, on the way back home, Coraline said, What's in the empty flat? I don't know. Nothing I expect. It probably looks like our flat before we moved in. Empty rooms. Do you think you could get into it from our flat? Not unless you walk through the bricks, dear. Oh. They got home around lunchtime. The sun was shining, although the day was cold. Coraline's mother looked in the fridge and found a sad little tomato and a piece of cheese with green stuff growing on it. There was only a crust in the bread bin. I'd better dash to down to the shops and get some fish fingers or something, said her mother. Do you want to come? No, said Coraline. Suit yourself, said her mother, and left. Then she came back and got her purse and car keys and went out again. Coraline was bored. She flipped through a book her mother was reading about native people in a distant country, how every day they would take pieces of white silk and draw on them in wax and then dip the silks in dye, then draw on them some with some more wax and dye, then some more, then boil the wax out in hot water, and finally throw the now beautiful cloths on a fire and burn them to ashes. It seemed particularly pointless to Coraline, but she hoped that the people enjoyed it. She was still bored, and her mother wasn't home yet. Coraline got a chair and pushed it over to the kitchen door. She climbed onto the chair and reached up. She got down, then got a broom from the broom cupboard. She climbed back up on the chair again and reached up with the broom. Clink! She climbed down from the chair and picked up the keys and smiled triumphantly. Then she leaned the broom against the wall and went into the drawing room. The family did not use the drawing room. They had inherited the furniture from Coraline's grandmother, along with a wooden coffee table, a side table, a heavy glass ashtray, and the oil painting of a bowl of fruit. Coraline could never work out why anyone would want to paint a bowl of fruit. Other than that, the room was empty. There were no knickknacks on the mantelpiece, no statues or clocks, nothing that made it feel comfortable or lived in. The old black key felt colder than any of the others. She pushed it into the keyhole. It turned smoothly with a satisfying clunk. 
Coraline stopped and listened. She knew she was doing something wrong, and she was trying to listen for her mother coming back, but she heard nothing. Then Coraline put her hand on the doorknob and turned it, and finally she opened the door. It opened onto a dark hallway. The bricks had gone as if they'd never been there. There was a cold, musty smell coming through the open doorway. It smelled like something very old and very slow. Coraline went through the door. She wondered what the empty flat would be like if that was where the corridor led. Coraline walked down the corridor uneasily. There was something very familiar about it. The carpet beneath her feet was the same carpet they had in her flat. The wallpaper was the same as the wallpaper they had. The picture hanging in the hall was the same that they had hanging in their hallway at home. She knew where she was. She was in her own home. She hadn't left. She shook her head, confused. She stared at the picture hanging on the wall. No, it wasn't exactly the same. The picture they had in their own hallway showed a boy in old-fashioned clothes staring at some bubbles. But now, the expression on his face was different. He was looking at the bubbles as if he was planning to do something very nasty indeed to them. And there was something peculiar about his eyes. Coraline stared at his eyes, trying to figure out what, was ex- what exactly was different. She almost had it when somebody said, Coraline? It sounded like her mother. Coraline went into the kitchen where the voice had come from. A woman stood in the kitchen with her back to Coraline. She looked a little like Coraline's mother, only her skin was as white as paper. Only she was taller and thinner. Only her fingers were too long and they never stopped moving, and her dark red fingernails were curved and sharp. Coraline, the woman said, is that you? And then she turned around. Her eyes were big black buttons. Lunchtime, Coraline, said the woman. Who are you, asked Coraline. I'm your other mother, said the woman. Go and tell your other father that lunch is ready. She opened the door of the oven. Suddenly, Coraline realized how hungry she was. It smelled wonderful. Well, go on. Coraline went down the hall to where her father's study was. She opened the door. There was a man in there, sitting at the keyboard with his back to her. Hello, said Coraline. I, I mean, she said to say that lunch is ready. The man turned around. His eyes were buttons, big and black and shiny. Hello, Coraline, he said. I'm starving. He got up and went with her into the kitchen. They sat at the kitchen table, and Coraline's other mother brought them lunch. A huge golden brown roasted chicken, fried potatoes, tiny green peas. Coraline shoveled the food into her mouth. It tasted wonderful. We've been waiting for you for a long time, said Coraline's other father. For me? Yes, said the other mother. It wasn't the same here without you, but we knew you'd arrive one day, and then we could be a proper family. Would you like some more chicken? It was the best chicken that Coraline had ever eaten. Her mother sometimes made chicken, but it was always out of the packets or frozen, and it was very dry, and it never tasted of anything. When Coraline's father cooked chicken, he bought real chicken, but he did strange things to it, like stewing it in wine, or stuffing it with prunes, or baking it in pastry, and Coraline would always refuse to touch it on principle. She took some more chicken. I didn't know I had another mother, said Coraline cautiously. Of course you do. Everyone does, said the other mother, her black button eyes gleaming. After lunch, I thought you might like to play in your room with the rats. The rats? Yeah, from upstairs. Coraline had never seen a rat, except on tele- on television. She was quite looking forward to it. This was turning out to be a very interesting day after all. After lunch, her other parents did the washing up, and Coraline went down the hall to her other bedroom. It was different from her bedroom at home. For a start, it was painted in an off-putting shade of green and a peculiar shade of pink. Coraline decided that she wouldn't want to have to sleep in there, but that the color scheme was an awful lot more interesting than her own bedroom. There were all sorts of remarkable things in there that she'd never seen before. Wind-up angels that fluttered around the bedroom like startled sparrows, books with pictures that writhed and crawled and shimmered, little dinosaur skulls that chattered their teeth as she passed, a whole toy box filled with wonderful toys. This is more like it, thought Coraline. She looked out of the window. Outside, the view was the same one she saw from her own bedroom. Trees, fields, and beyond them, on the horizon, distant purple hills. Something black scurried across the floor and vanished under the bed. Coraline got down on her knees and looked under the bed. Fifty little red eyes stared back at her. Hello, said Coraline. Are you the rats? They came out from under the bed, flicking their eyes in the light. They had short, soot black fur, little red eyes, pink paws like tiny hands, and pink hairless tails like long, smooth worms. Can you talk? she asked. The largest, blackest of the rats shook its head. It had an unpleasant sort of smile, Coraline thought. Well, asked Coraline, what do you do? The rats formed a circle. Then they began to climb on top of each other 
carefully but swiftly until they had formed a pyramid with the largest rat at the top. The rats began to sing in high, whispery voices. We have teeth and we have tails. We have tails, we have eyes. We were here before you fell. You will be here when you rise. It wasn't a pretty song. Coraline was sure she'd heard it before, or something like it, although she was unable to remember exactly where. Then the pyramid fell apart and the rats scampered, fast and black, toward the door. The other crazy old man upstairs was standing in the doorway, holding a tall black hat in his hands. The rats scampered up him, burrowing into his pockets, into his shirt, up his trouser legs, and down his neck. The largest rat climbed onto the old man's shoulders, swung up on the long gray mustache past the big black button eyes and onto the top of the man's head. In seconds, the only evidence that the rats were there at all were the restless lumps under the man's clothes, forever sliding from place to place across him. And there was still the largest rat, who stared down with glittering red eyes at Coraline from the man's head. The old man put his hat on and the last rat was gone. Hello, Coraline, said the other old man upstairs. I heard you were here. It is time for the rats to have their dinner, but you can come up with me if you'd like and watch them feed. There was some, something hungry in the old man's button eyes that made Coraline feel uncomfortable. No, thank you, she said. I'm going outside to explore. The old man nodded very slowly. Coraline could hear the rats whispering to each other, although she could not tell what they were saying. She was not certain that she wanted to know what they were saying. Her other parents stood in the kitchen doorway as she walked down the corridor, smiling identical smiles and waving slowly. Have a nice time outside, said her other mother. We'll just wait here for you to come back, said her other father. When Coraline got to the front door, she turned back and looked at them. They were still watching her and waving and smiling. Coraline walked outside and down the steps. Chapter 4. The house looked exactly the same from the outside, or almost exactly the same. Around Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's door were blue and red light bulbs that flashed on and off, spelling out words, the lights chasing each other around. On and off, around and around. Astounding was followed by a theatrical and then triumph. It was a sunny, cold day, exactly like the one she left. There was a polite noise from behind her. She turned around. Standing on the wall next to her was a large black cat, identical to the large black cat she'd seen in the grounds at home. Good afternoon, said the cat. Its voice sounded like the voice at the back of Coraline's head, the voice she thought words in, but a man's voice, not a girl's. Hello, said Coraline. I saw a cat like you in the garden at home. You must be the other cat. The cat shook its head. No, it said. I'm not the other anything. I'm me. It tipped its head to one side, and its green eyes glinted. You people are spread all over the place. Cats, on the other hand, keep ourselves together, if you see what I mean. I suppose, but if you're the same cat I saw at home, how can you talk? Cats don't have shoulders, not like people do, but the cat shrugged in one smooth movement that started at the tip of its tail and ended in a, ride, in a raised movement of its whiskers. I can talk. Cats don't talk at home. No, said the cat. No, said Coraline. The cat leaped smoothly from the wall to the grass near Coraline's feet. It stared up at her. Well, you're the expert on these things, said the cat dryly. After all, what would I know? I'm only a cat. It began to walk away, head and tail held high and proud. Come back, said Coraline. Please, I'm sorry, I really am. The cat stopped walking, sat down, and began to wash itself thoughtfully, apparently unaware of Coraline's existence. We, we could be friends, you know, said Coraline. We could be rare specimens of an exotic breed of African dancing elephants, said the cat, but we're not. At least, it added cattily after darting a brief look at Coraline, I'm not. Coraline sighed, please, what's your name, Coraline asked the cat. Look, I'm Coraline, okay? The cat yawned slowly, carefully, revealing a mouth and tongue of astounding pinkness. Cats don't have names, it said. No, said Coraline. No, said the cat. Now you people have names. That's because you don't know who you are. We know who we are, so we don't need names. There was something irritatingly self-centered about the cat, Coraline decided, as if it were, in its opinion, the only thing in any world or place that could possibly be of any importance. Half of her wanted to be very rude to it. The other half of her wanted to be polite and differential. The polite half won. Please, what is this place? The cat glanced around briefly. It's here, said the cat. I can see that. Well, how did you get here? Like you did. I walked, said the cat, like this. Coraline watched as the cat walked slowly across the lawn. It walked behind a tree, 
but didn't come out the other side. Coraline went over to the tree and looked behind it, but the cat was gone. She walked back toward the house. There was another polite noise from behind her. It was the cat. By the by, it said, it was sensible of you to bring protection. I'd hang on to it if I were you. Protection? That's what I said, said the cat, and anyway, it paused and stared intently at something that wasn't there. Then it went down into a low crouch and moved slowly forward, two or three steps. It seemed to be stalking an invisible mouse. Abruptly, it turned tail and dashed for the woods and vanished among the trees. Coraline wondered what the cat had meant. She also wondered whether cats could all talk where she came from and just chose not to, or whether they could only talk when they were here, wherever here was. She walked down the brick steps to the Mrs. Spink and Forcible's front door. The blue and red lights flashed on and off. The door was open, just slightly. She knocked on it, but her first knock made the door swing open and Coraline went in. She was in a dark room that smelled of dust and velvet. The door swung shut behind her, and the room was black. Coraline edged forward into a small anteroom. Her face brushed against something soft. It was cloth. She reached up her hand and pushed at the cloth, and it parted. She stood, blinking on the other side of the velvet curtains in a poorly lit theater. Far away at the edge of the room was a high wooden stage, empty and bare, a dim spotlight shining onto it from high above. There were seats between Coraline and the stage, rows and rows of seats. She heard a shuffling noise, and a light came toward her, swinging from side to side. When it was closer, closer, she saw the light was coming from a flashlight being carried in the mouth of a large black Scotty dog, its muzzle gray with age. Hello, said Coraline. The dog put the flashlight down on the floor and looked up at her. Right, let's see your ticket, he said gruffly. Ticket? That's what I said. Ticket. I haven't got all day, you know. You can't watch the show without a ticket. Coraline sighed. I don't have a ticket, she admitted. Another one, said the dog gloomily. Come in here, bold as anything. Where's your ticket? Haven't got one? I don't know. It shook its head, then shrugged. Come on, then. He picked up the flashlight in his mouth and trotted off into the dark. Coraline followed him. When he got near the front of the stage, he stopped and shone the flashlight onto an empty seat. Coraline sat down, and the dog wandered off. As her eyes got used to the darkness, she realized that the other inhabitants of the seats were also dogs. There was a sudden hissing noise from behind the stage. Coraline decided that it was the sound of a scratchy old record being put onto a record player. The hissing became the noise of trumpets, and Miss Spink and Miss Forcible came onto the stage. Miss Spink was riding a one-wheeled bicycle and juggling balls. Miss Forcible skipped behind her, holding a basket of flowers. She scattered the flower petals across the stage as she went. They reached the front of the stage, and Miss Spank leaped nimbly off the unicycle, and the two old women bowed low. All the dogs stumped their tails and barked enthusiastically. Coraline clapped politely. Then they unbuttoned their fluffy round coats and opened them, but their coats weren't all that opened. Their faces opened too, like empty shells, and out of the old, empty, fluffy round bodies stepped two young women. They were thin and pale and quite pretty and had black button eyes. The new Miss Spink was wearing green tights and high brown boots that went most of the way up her legs. The new Miss Forcible wore a white dress and had flowers in her long yellow hair. Coraline pressed back against her seat. Miss Spink went off the stage and the noise of trumpets squealed as the gramophone needle dug its way across the record and was pulled off. This is my favorite bit, whispered the little dog in the seat next to her. The other Miss Forcible picked a knife out of a box on the corner of the stage. Is this a dagger that I see before me? She asked. Yes, shouted all the little dogs. It is. Miss Forcible curtsied and all the dogs applauded again. Coraline didn't bother clapping this time. Miss Spink came back on. She slapped her thigh and all the little dogs woofed. And now, Miss Spink said, Miriam and I proudly present a new and exciting adenendum to our theatrical exposition. Do I see a volunteer? The little dog next to Coraline nudged her with its front paw. That's you, it hissed. Coraline stood up and walked up to the wooden steps to the stage. Can I have a big round of applause for the young volunteer? asked Miss Spink. The dogs whooped and squealed and thumped their tails on the velvet seats. Now Coraline, said Miss Spink. What's your name? Coraline, said Coraline. And we don't know each other, do we? Coraline looked at the thin young woman with black button eyes and shook her head slowly. Now, said the other Miss Spink, stand over here. She led Coraline over to a board by the side of the stage and put a balloon on top of Coraline's head. Miss Spink walked over to Miss Forcible. She blindfolded Miss Forcible's button knives with a black scarf and put the knife into her hands. Then she turned her around three or four times and pointed her at Coraline. Coraline held her breath and squeezed her fingers into two tight fists. 
Miss Forcible threw the knife at the balloon. It popped loudly, and the knife stuck into the board just above Coraline's head and twanged there. Coraline breathed out. The dogs went wild. Miss Fink gave Coraline a very small box of chocolates and thanked her for being such a good sport, and Coraline went back to her seat. You are very good, said the little dog. Thank you, said Coraline. Miss Forcible and Miss Fink began juggling with huge wooden clubs. Coraline opened the box of chocolates, and the dog looked at them longingly. Would you like one? she asked the little dog. Yes, please, whispered the dog. Only not talky ones. They make me drool. I thought chocolates weren't very good for dogs, she said, remembering something Miss Forcible had once told her. Maybe where you come from, whispered the little dog. Here, it's all we eat. Coraline couldn't see what the chocolates were in the dark. She took an experimental bite of one, which turned out to be coconut. Coraline didn't like coconut, so she gave it to the dog. Thank you, said the dog. You're welcome, said Coraline. Miss Forcible and Miss Spink were doing some acting. Miss Forcible was sitting on a stepladder, and Miss Spink was standing at the bottom. What's in a name? asked Miss Forcible. That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Have you got any more chocolates? said the dog. Coraline gave the dog another chocolate. I know not how to tell thee who I am, said Miss Spink to Miss Forcible. This bit finishes soon, whispered the dog. Then they start folk dancing. How long does this go on for? asked Coraline. The theater. All the time, said the dog, forever and always. Here, said Coraline, keep the chocolates. Thank you, said the dog, and Coraline stood up. See you soon, said the dog. Bye, said Coraline, and she walked up the theater and back into the garden. She had to blink her eyes at the daylight. Her other parents were waiting for her in the garden, standing side by side. They were smiling. Did you have a nice time, asked her other mother. It was interesting, said Coraline. The three of them walked back up to Coraline's other house together. Coraline's other mother stroked Coraline's hair with her long, white fingers. Coraline shook her head. Don't do that, she said. Her other mother took her hand away. So, said her other father, do you like it here? I suppose, said Coraline. It's much more interesting than at home. They went inside. I'm glad you like it, said Coraline's mother, because we'd like to think that this is your home. You can stay here forever and always, if you want to. Hmm, said Coraline. She put her hand in her pockets and thought about it. Her hand touched the stone that the real Miss Spink and Forcible had given her the day before, the stone with the hole in it. If you want to stay, said her other father, there's only one little thing we'll have to do, so you can stay here forever and always. They went to the kitchen. On a china plate on the kitchen table was a spool of black cotton and a long silver needle, and beside them, two large black buttons. I don't think so, said Coraline. Oh, but we want you to, said her other mother. We want you to stay, and it's just a little thing. It won't hurt, said her other father. Coraline knew that when grown-ups told you something would hurt, wouldn't hurt, it almost always did. She shook her head. Her other mother smiled brightly, and the hair on her head drifted like plants under the sea. We only want what's best for you, she said. She put her hand on Coraline's shoulder, and Coraline backed away. I'm going now, said Coraline. She put her hands in her pockets. Her fingers closed around the stone with the hole in it. Her other mother's hand scuttled off Coraline's shoulder like a frightened spider. If that's what you want, she said. Yes, said Coraline. We'll see you soon, though, said her other father, when you come back. Um, said Coraline. And then we'll all be together as one big happy family, said her other mother, forever and always. Coraline backed away. She turned and hurried into the drawing room and pulled open the door in the corner. There was no brick wall there now, just darkness, a night black underground darkness that seemed as if things in it might be moving. Coraline hesitated. She turned back. Her other mother and her other father were walking toward her, holding hands. They were looking at her with their big black button eyes, or at least she thought they were looking at her. She couldn't be sure. Her other mother reached out her free hand and beckoned, gently, with one white finger. Her pale lips mouthed, come back soon, although she said nothing aloud. Coraline took a deep breath and she stepped into the darkness, where strange voices whispered and distant winds howled. She became certain that there was something in the dark behind her, something very old and very slow. Her heart beat so hard, so loudly, she was scared it would burst out of her chest. She closed her eyes against the dark. Eventually, she bumped into something and opened her eyes, startled. She had bumped into an armchair in her drawing room. The open doorway behind her was blocked by rough red bricks. She was home.